Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our uh, webinar series. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is Ahmed Abu Bakr from the Egyptian Society of Subsea Engineers. Uh, today we have a, an uh, interesting topic about subsea manifold designs. We're hosting uh, our guest speaker, engineer Ayman Abdel Hadi, who uh, thankfully agreed to give us uh, an infor informative session about uh, subsea design. Uh, his experience in uh, piping and uh, uh, subsea design in, in general. He has worked also with various uh, companies in all aspects from contractors to operators and uh, also uh, design houses and engineering firms. So uh, I will let him also, uh, I will let him to introduce himself better than I do. Uh, thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, you can also always uh, type your questions in the chat box. And at the end of the session, we can have a Q&A session, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. So I will pass the stage to Engineer Ayman to start to introduce himself and also to give us uh, this awaited session we waited for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. And uh, I'm delighted to be here today and giving me this opportunity to talk to your uh, society. And uh, it, it's good to share information uh, in Egypt. Uh, as uh, I think there is a, a huge potential uh, in the future uh, in the Mediterranean, which is turning to be more like uh, a new copy of uh, the Gulf of Mexico with uh, re regards of huge reserves and uh, gas uh, in subsea fields. Um, today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, subsea manifolds. Uh, First, I'll just uh, like this. Yeah. Okay, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I have uh, worked uh, almost most of my career in uh, oil and gas industry, and I've worked with uh, different uh, contractors and uh, also along with operators uh, in the field of uh, detail engineering uh, uh, in subsea for uh, del delivering different projects and uh, different field studies different EPC projects. And uh, recently I'm uh, more into uh, project uh, executions and uh, follow-up for, uh, for projects. And uh, I've been, uh, as you mentioned, I've uh, been moving a uh, little, uh, little bit around the world a lot, uh, worked in Egypt and uh, in Norway and uh, India, Turkey and France uh, a little bit as well. So always, uh, I'll be delighted if uh, you be in touch with me in case you uh, have any question or uh, or I can assist in anything. Uh, as you all know, uh, and, and uh, when we talk about top C, uh, we have different uh, products uh, which we use uh, starting from the Christmas trees. Uh, until it reaches uh, the destination, where whether it's um, an onshore facility or uh, a floating uh, solution. Probably all of you are now looking at uh, the, the fish uh, down there. And uh, it, it's quite interesting when you go uh, uh, in the deep sea, you will find everything a little bit uh, strange. Uh, this type of fish, it's uh, the, the easy name for it is uh, uh, a tripod fish it have legs as you can see and sometimes it will be just standing actually on the seabed as you can see and it reaches the depths of 6,000 meters. Now uh, one of the interesting uh, codes we use at subsea is uh, of course uh, the ISO uh, 13628 uh, series and uh, this image is an extract from that uh, code and uh, here you can see an example showing uh, the different uh, uh, structures we use when we uh, architect uh, a new field. So uh, you can see here a tree uh, cluster manifold, which we will talk about, uh, PLEM pipeline end manifold, and PLET uh, pipeline end termination in line T, and sometimes we use also subsea pump skids. Now, uh, what, what's the purpose of, uh, of the manifold in, in general? It, uh, it gives us uh, uh, several features. Uh, the main features, as you know, 
uh, look, looking on, on the previous uh, image or this image, is that it uh, collects the fluid coming, whether it's gas or oil, and uh, collects it that we will get it through one pipeline, which will go towards the final distillation uh, downstream, whether it's um, a topside facility or uh, a floating solution like an FPSO or FSU. Uh, it also, um, as long as uh, other than it's collecting uh, the fluid from different wells, it also, it, it, uh, as you can, you can see, it's like more like an interface point between the pipeline and the wells. Uh, it's like in the middle and you can uh, control uh, what you want to close and what you want to open, which well is operating and which well you will not use now, which well you, you will use in the future and so on. As uh, a structure, uh, normally we design the structure to protect uh, whatever lies inside it from uh, the valuable uh, subsea valves, uh, connection systems, whether it's vertical, horizontal, we will show you some examples later. And uh, also sometimes there is a requirement um, to, to have what's called a docking station for the ROV, so that during installation or maintenance or an inspection, uh, there is a place where the ROV will sit on actually on, let's say, the top or whatever the place you design, so that the ROV can rest sometimes on your structure. Uh, it's also, uh, we need to put in consideration the point of dropped objects, especially if uh, the, um, the depth is shallow, so that uh, if anything uh, drops from above, uh, it will not damage uh, any of uh, the equipment of the manifold. And normally, uh, from what I've seen, the manifold is designed, in most cases, to operate at least 20 or 25 years. So you want to ensure that it will operate without any problems. Uh, also, to have uh, a mix of uh, electrical or umbilical lines, which will uh, give the signals to different equipments like the pulse, sensors, meters to operate and, and uh, tell us also if there is any problem. And uh, finally, you design it as well, uh, for, uh, depending on your design, could be uh, according to the size, uh, having a one lift point to lift the whole manifold or uh, four points. Uh, and also you put in mind, are you going to retrieve it in the future for decommissioning purpose or if you have any problem? So also uh, it's designed in case after operating 10 years that maybe you, you might uh, be forced to lift it above again. Uh, this uh, schematic here, I like this one, it explains also for, for you different types of manifolds and according to the, the plan here, how uh, you want to extract the oil or gas. Sometimes we don't need a manifold at all. Uh, if you have um, a simple and uh, just one or two uh, wells, so directly you uh, are connecting your lines or subsea lines towards the Christmas trees. Or there are two solutions. Um, the most common now is a cluster manifold, like the one you can see on the top uh, bottom right, where you can see the manifold is in the center and around it, you have the different Christmas trees gathered around it. And you can see all the lines are going towards the manifold. And then only one line here in this example, you have uh, a 10 inch production flow line so all the lines, uh, let's say if they were six inch, they are gathering to, toward the manifold. And then the out line is just one line going to the platform. Uh, there is an, uh, an older version used, sometimes it could be used till now, but it's a little rare, which is called a template manifold. And uh, in here, uh, you can see that um, the manifold is, uh, uh, much more complex because it contains all the Christmas trees as well. So you have the Christmas trees, bulbs, everything uh, through, through that uh, manifold. Uh, 
and I'll try to give more details about two types in the coming slides. Uh, here's another um, uh, views of the cluster manifold from the ISO code. And uh, you can see uh, there are different configuration, but the, the idea is, is, uh, is the same as what I mentioned. You have the manifold in, in the somewhere in the middle and around it, you have the Christmas trees where all where the manifold is collecting the gas or the oil from them. And uh, this is an example also from the ISO, the, um, the template manifold. And uh, here's a difference um, that uh, it's more like a big, very big cage. And you do the drilling and uh, the installation of the Christmas tree and everything through the template itself. So it contains everything. It, it's, it's more complex and uh, um, need more control to, to do such uh, uh, a subsea structure be, because everything here is more uh, combined in one point and connected. And uh, as, you, as we go through, you will always, if you um, uh, read the famous uh, novel about Captain Nemo, it was, was very interesting because in the old times, uh, before they even invented submarines or ROV, he uh, have a concept about uh, Captain Nemo uh, uh, submarine and uh, gave us some insights where some of them are actually turning uh, true a little bit, except uh, strange creatures and stuff. But uh, it's, it's really interesting. Some people... Uh, don't uh, imagine the challenges in the seabed and how uh, it's, it's sometimes very difficult to do the installation and uh, any tiny mistake can mean that your structure we will uh, we are not able actually to install and i'll also try to show you uh, some examples later uh, that's another example of uh, cluster uh, manifold uh, here you can see it's um, it looks like the, the one on the left side, the 14 wells cluster manifold. It's more uh, simple, it's not very complicated, and it doesn't have uh, Christmas trees. It's it just uh, collecting, as I mentioned, the through different branches, the oil or gas coming from different wells, and combine it to um, an outlet line so that you are gathering all the liquid to, uh, through one line. On the, on the, the, pic, the picture on the top, the yellow structure, that's actually uh, the project I've done. It's actually a plem, but uh, some people called it a manifold sometime in, uh, due to its size uh, in that project. Uh, one of the points I always distinguish between a plem and a manifold is actually uh, the control point because uh, normally a PLEM doesn't have uh, an automated uh, uh, valves. It's all through ROV. Uh, it doesn't have any uh, control units. So uh, it, it just, uh, you use it sometime uh, to close a line or open a line, but it's not complicated like uh, the manifolds because it have uh, much more uh, sensors and uh, distribution units. Uh, this uh, that's an old design. As you, as you can see, uh, this is a template. So you, you can imagine the size of it. Sometimes it's like uh, the size of uh, a football field, and uh, it have uh, different. It's like many skids connected to each other. You have a place to install the uh, let's say here 14 christmas trees that's a lot and in between you are connecting uh, lines valves and everything to also gather everything through one line the main uh, if we are comparing uh, here the different what's the difference between these two types of manifolds the template and the cl cluster manifold. Uh, as you can see from the, or you have seen from the previous uh, photos, you can imagine that the template is more uh, 
complicated. It needs lots of engineering hours. Uh, it needs uh, lots of uh, detailed planning uh, regarding an installation. And of course, it's more costly because uh, for a solution like that, you have to have all most of your subsea structures ready, all your Christmas trees, uh, the manifold, and uh, you try to almost do the installation in one go. So uh, here uh, it will be a, a very costly uh, investment at the beginning. But the cluster manifold is different because you can have a plan that, okay, I'll first install the Christmas trees. Later, I'll place a manifold somewhere in the dedicated location. And then I'll start to connect them through jumpers. So here it's like uh, different uh, offshore campaigns. Uh, so I don't need to have a huge capex uh, ahead of uh, this installation campaign. So it, it's more relaxed. Uh, protection uh, wise might be the template. It's, um, it's, it's a better solution regarding dropped objects and this stuff because it have lots of steel. Uh, in a, a solution like the cluster manifold, uh, we leave uh, the jumpers uh, not protected, but some or, or sometimes we uh, put what's called the GRP covers around them. Uh, so here there could be a little risk sometimes that I'm having some points exposed for um, uh, dropped objects. Uh, in installation wise, uh, of course, uh, templates, um, as you can see, it's, it's more costly to install uh, because you will need uh, special vessels to be able to carry such load and lower it uh, through the splash zone and uh, do the installation. While a manifold, uh, normal cluster manifolds, uh, you don't need the huge uh, installation vessels. Uh, Schedule-wise, uh, also a cluster manifold uh, could offer you a, a much more fast track uh, possibility to finish the project in a, in a quicker way than the template. Uh, because the template to fabricate all that and do the testing and uh, do this control uh, installation can take a uh, longer time. Uh, decommissioning wise also, if I'm planning to get uh, a template outside of the water, it could be also challenging. It's much more heavier. Uh, and uh, while the cluster manifold, it's, it, it could be a little lighter and, and easy to maneuver underwater. Uh, finally, uh, accessibility wise, sometimes you have uh, uh, the need to do inspection, to do uh, uh, some sort of uh, an installation towards a tree or something. And the accessibility in template in the template manifold is much tighter, but uh, it's much more easy in the cluster manifold where uh, you can inspect through ROV and uh, uh, deinstall or install something uh, in, in a much more easy way. Okay. So uh, going through a little bit in details about the, any, de any design of uh, the subsea manifold, you can, you can translate this one to departments, the people behind the scenes who design the manifold. So you will, you will need a piping department and you will need a valve department. Also you have painting and uh, the cathodic protection design. This is normally done by material engineers. And you have uh, control systems, like the one I mentioned, like- uh, Tatekhi, what do you want? So, okay, so uh, the control systems like uh, the S uh, SCM, the subsea control module, for example, which is, I'll, I'll show you to later, which is the brain of the manifold. It gives the signals to the valve, what to open, what to close and so on. And you, you need also uh, a system engineering department to do the flow assurance, which is very important as well. It will uh, give the client an idea uh, to assure him that through the 20 years or 25 or whatever more than that, 
it will operate without any problems like the erosion and so on. And of course, you uh, need an important department, which is the connection systems. And these are the guys who design the connection system, whether it's uh, vertical or horizontal. And uh, finally, you need also a structural department, structural engineers who will design the frame, uh, the pipe supports, and, and all of that. So uh, if you imagine if you put uh, two people in uh, each department, you need fairly a, a big team here to design these uh, structures. So the more we, we come up with a simple design, uh, the more we can reduce engineering hours and make it more easy to coordinate between all these departments. Okay, um, now I'm going to start also here regarding an uh, important point, which is uh, subsea foundation. Uh, when we uh, design any structure like, like the manifold and we want to place it so, uh, at subsea bed, we need to uh, okay have a decision. What type of foundation are we going to use? So here, one of the important, uh, very important uh, inputs normally comes, of course, from the operator uh, is a subsea survey. You, you need like a fresh uh, subsea survey for the seabed to see how it looks like, the elevations uh, uh, and everything. And if there are drop, dropped objects, uh, rocks, whatever, uh, it gives you an idea about all the fields. And of course, where are, where are the locations of your Christmas trees or wells? And also, same like what we do in uh, onshore sites, before the construction begins, we normally do uh, site preparations where you get uh, a soil uh, samples and uh, you, you get to know the seabed status. Uh, then you, you, de you decide how you can uh, place your structure on that seabed. And all that is translated also, uh, is given as an input to, towards a geotechnical study. So at the end, you have also a geotechnical study with figures showing you, uh, according to size, what, what's uh, the best solution for the foundation. Foundation-wise, uh, when I get this information from the geotechnical uh, guys, they give me uh, uh, give me some uh, they give me some important information like uh, the footprint they will uh, guide you tell you okay the manifold needs to be for example five meter by fifty meter okay and uh, they will tell you also the penetration weight uh, like the the manifold shouldn't be less than three hundred tons for example then you know your limit, you know uh, where, if your structure is very light or very heavy. And finally, uh, the foundation type. And foundation types is, as I mentioned, is known from the soil. If it's hard, normally uh, we use a mud mat. And uh, if it's medium or soft, uh, we use suction piles, like the picture on the... Um, uh, left side, these, these are suction piles, and it's very similar to the one uh, ones used in Zohr. It was one of the biggest I've seen, maybe 15 or 12 meter long. And, and normally we use this type in soil, we call it yogurt, it's like yogurt. Like uh, imagine all the steel uh, dives actually in the seabed, all goes below and becomes your foundation, which are holding the whole uh, structure. Now, uh, sp speaking uh, about challenges in uh, in the sub subsea bed, what happens if uh, some something goes wrong? Uh, if, for example, uh, if I'm landing uh, the structure very uh, quickly, uh, very fast. What will happen? I'll not. It will not be able to actually penetrate the soil as I've planned. 
So it must uh, be controlled uh, through the installation vessels. The, the, the lowering speed of the crane and uh, in, a, in a very uh, important manner to avoid problems. And uh, it could happen sometimes that um, the, um, the uh, geotechnical study or the survey uh, gave us uh, wrong information. The, the soil actually was um, much more stronger than we expected to have more gravel or operational problems like we use uh, suction pumps to also like if you have four legs uh, diving in the seabed you want to control it level it so we use suction pumps if one leg is not operating uh, it, then it will actually um, uh, be inclined not not as uh, i've planned and, and finally, if, as I mentioned, if uh, uh, here the SPS contractor came up with a design which is actually lighter than we need, then we have also a problem that uh, structure is not actually penetrating or going through uh, the seabed as, uh, as we uh, anticipated. So here comes more costs from the installation contractor where we will need to have a another uh, like a plan B uh, doing uh, rock dumping uh, or these operations, which are also costly. Uh, that's another example here um, the, about challenges we, which we, we may face, like if uh, also the seabed were not wasn't studied uh, correctly from any party, you can find that um, the your structure is uh, is actually not meeting the uh, the seabed uh, ge geometry. So one leg is like flying a little bit above the seabed, and the other one is penetrating with an angle. So here you can see uh, sometimes damage happening to the soil and then gives us an idea that, okay, maybe the suction pile is damaged. So we'll have to retrieve it and it's very complex uh, operation. And, uh, and also the, that, that plot plan you can see on the top to give you an idea. All uh, these lines are actually, uh, for who, who doesn't know, these lines are slopes of, uh, of the seabed. So it's not like a flat land like we are walking uh, around here. Like you, sometimes it's like canyons and uh, and levels, and you are placing a structure. So it's not it's not easy. And so, sometimes seabed is uh, simple; it's actually flat. But sometimes it comes with slopes, angles, and here you have to uh, think out of the box sometimes and uh, use lots of method to match these angles, especially if you also using uh, rigid, rigid pipelines to connect structures. Uh, here are uh, some also real uh, figures from life about uh, foundations. And you can see uh, the ones at the top are uh, what we call the suction cans, as I mentioned. And uh, you can imagine like the one on the left that's a circular suction cans. That was similar to Zohar in Egypt, but much smaller. Uh, and here, according to the code, we don't paint all the suction can. So you can imagine the, the bar steel, the one not painted, is designed that all this will go uh, under the seabed. It will suck the sand and go down. And uh, only the yellow part is the one that should be above the seabed. Or a little bit, let's say, sometimes uh, uh, doesn't go through all of, all of them underwater. But the main idea that all the bar steel, not painted, is the one that goes under the seabed. Uh, another type which uh, I've used and some operators are using, uh, uh, it's, it's much more easy to fabricate and uh, and easy and, and more fast to do is um, it, it looks like a container. It's the same idea. It's like a suction can, but it's done from what's called uh, corrugated plates. 
the corrugated plates are welded together. It, it gives you this shape of a rectangle. It's like a huge, uh, it's like a mud mat, but with the depths. And all that also, the one not painted is the one that goes under the seabed. The, the figure at the bottom is the mud mat. And you can see uh, the idea is um, that you don't need uh, anything to actually go under the seabed. You need a little bit of uh, seabed penetration just to fix it in, in place, but uh, it's not designed that uh, you will have uh, whether it's corrugated plates or suction cans that goes under the water. It's actually more like resting on the seabed because the seabed here is uh, very hard. And uh, this is more you can see in places like in Perth, in Australia, and maybe other places in the world. And here's this uh, very short video. It will give you an idea about uh, the In this video, you will watch Kongsberg Oil & Gas successfully deliver the foundation slide plate for the pipeline and determination to the Stat Oil Polar Lead project. The delivery took place on May 2nd, 2015 from the Kongsberg workshop in Drammen. The foundation slide plate is a giant and moving the 230 ton structure from the Drammen workshop to the heavy lift vessel was a challenge. The operation needed efficient planning as well as precise work at the site. The next phase for Kongsberg in the polar lead project will be to deliver the pipeline in termination this summer. Um, anybody uh, need to ask any questions because before I proceed? Uh, I think in general, I mean, we have a, an earlier question. It was about the uh, the number of the ISO code you're using for manifold design. Okay, all right. It's just in time. I will go through that. Uh, okay. Uh, talking about the design code in uh, subsea structures is very interesting uh, because it's not easy. It's not like uh, the onshore or offshore projects. Uh, it's a mix of a lot, a lot of uh, different uh, places. Uh, of course, one of the, the main uh, here uh, driving codes is uh, the ISO. Uh, and we're talking about the 13628 uh, series. And there are a couple of them I'll show you uh, after a while. And uh, here, this is like the main guide for different parts for SPS contractors who design different structures like the manifold plates, uh, jumpers, whatever. And also there are ones for the ROV or interfaces or Christmas trees. It's, it's a big family here and everybody, according to the product he's designing, he uh, must follow it. And there is also one for valves, everything. And also we follow in many cases uh, DNV code. There are also uh, a lot of them according to some calculations and stuff because uh, DNV was developed by uh, Norway to like fill in the gap of uh, missing codes which are not dedicated for any structures underwater. And uh, also when we talk about uh, structural design, we uh, right now uh, I see the trend. Everybody is using the Eurocode, especially what's called the Eurocode three. Uh, before in Norway, for example, they was using for structure analysis uh, uh, a Norwegian code. Uh, I think it was NS three four seven two, but it's depleted now. It's not used, and they also use now the Eurocode. So here, uh, this three type of in, uh, uh, design codes or places are uh, are used in structural design. Uh, the ISO code, I, I like this uh, figure, you can find it online. It's developed by the ISO. As you can see, it's a huge family. It's starting from onshore, offshore, whatever type. There is a huge number of ISO codes that normally used. But if I here uh, zoom in to uh, the subsea part, 
you can see here these are uh, to answer your question these are the codes that uh, covers uh, all subsea product whatever underwater uh, here as we are talking about uh, subsea manifolds uh, the one i uh, placed uh, the rectangle are the, the around, around them are the one mainly used for uh, subsea manifolds uh, the uh, number one, the one, three, six, two, eight, one, and eight, and 15. Uh, eight uh, normally ha uh, help me in the interface part. Like if I'm having a, a valve, subsea valve, and uh, according to what I'm, uh, I'm designing what's called the ROV bucket, right? So here uh, it's according to that one, one, three, six, two, eight. It gives me the idea. Uh, oh so that the, the valve vendor will follow it and also the installation contractor will follow it because he's the one providing the tools during the installation, operation, anything. So that's an important one for interface because you are having items connecting connected to your subsea structure and also uh, people who are, uh, whether even in shallow water, if, if you are doing a, an operation, uh, also, like, 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 for example, the grabber bars, the grabber bars are normally used. Uh, it's a simple um, uh, bars welded in your structure. You weld it in different places so that the ROV is like a human being. It's, uh, the ROV will grab the grabber bar with one hand and the other hand he is doing an operation like opening a valve or something. So here, all the, this design, is, uh, is uh, in this code he tells you what to do exactly what what dimensions of the grabber bar and so on and uh, in the last one the um, number 15 this also gives me more details about uh, design considerations i should follow when i'm designing a manifold i'll also try to give you more details about that Uh, the one I mentioned at the beginning, number one, the, the ISO code 136281. Uh, here it's, it's, um, it's giving the designer a global uh, idea about the consideration, consideration he should use uh, or consider. Like, for example, um, the environment, the, the depths, the, the wave, the current. Uh, he will give you tables about uh, how the manifold should be designed. In, in such um, uh, data and also gives um, like uh, instructions for the installation contractor uh, regarding, as I mentioned, uh, lowering uh, speed and all these uh, thing, things. And uh, also give, uh, give me some classification with respect to pressure, temperature, and so on. And one important aspect as, as, as well, I'll also try to explain it more, is, um, is uh, fishing requirements. Uh, if I'm uh, placing a structure in shallow waters or places where there are uh, fishing activities, how can I protect the structures uh, from uh, uh, the, trow the trowels or the equipment the, uh, the fishing companies are using? And at the same time, how, uh, like, I, I also don't harm the ships that something gets uh, in their nets uh, or, or stops their operation. And uh, here also gives me instructions about uh, permanent loads, accidental, uh, accidental like uh, uh, the trawling, as, as I mentioned, what, what happens if a net uh, hits my structure, how I can protect the structure against, and uh, operational loads, and uh, occasional loads like earthquakes and so on. And also gives me uh, the system engineering uh, department uh, insights about uh, flow assurance checks I need to, to do. Uh, also regarding installation operation it, it have lots of uh, figures and requirements and templates as well to follow 
and uh, always when you open an, uh, an ISO code, you can uh, at the beginning tell you what this code is covering. So you can see here, this is also extract from the ISO. You can see uh, what here the ISO, what structures it, it's covering. It's covering here as, as uh, the, ma the manifold and template, what we are talking about, uh, beside other, other ones like risers, SSIV, uh, flow lines, and so on. The, the last one we talked about, uh, 1362815, it will give me more uh, details about the loads itself, uh, it's, because here it's like giving you depths inside regarding the design. So uh, here I'm having, the, I'll try to go through it in details later also, uh, different type of loads, uh, external loads. Uh, the snag loads here are uh, the one I mentioned uh, if you have a structure and, and then something is uh, hitting it from a side, like uh, this huge uh, uh, traveling equipment from fishing, uh, and uh, I'm having the design loads, I'm having uh, thermal expansion during um, different temperatures, uh, ambient temperature or seabed uh, or, or the seawater temperature, and all this stuff you need to uh, consider when you are designing your piping systems. Uh, here I, I made the, also like to give you an idea about the over -trawling. Uh, as I mentioned, which is also here uh, mentioned and, and uh, in hazards and risks in the ISO uh, 136281. Uh, and normally if you uh, having a, a field in the area of, uh, of subsea activities, and, and especially if it's shallow, not very deep, you hear uh, like uh, as an operator, you will dedicate to the dictate to the SPS that okay, there is an over um, uh, functionalities that you need to follow. So here, what normally is done uh, that the SPS will design a, a more like a cage, and you can see uh, with an angle reaching sixty degrees. And the idea that, as you can see from the figure. When you have uh, the, this huge over troweling uh, net, you are grabbing and moving with it. And, and it, sometimes it stuns, it's heavy. Uh, you design your structure that uh, nothing will uh, get stuck to the structure. It will just slide with angle and move along with, without uh, harming anybody, the, 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 whether it's the structure or the, the ship which is uh, uh, moving that net. So what we do normally, we do this type of design with the angle and we follow this table from the ISO, uh, from the ISO code. And personally, what I do when I design, I will take the, uh, the highest, uh, uh, highest value of them all to be on the safe side. What if this load hits structure and I do a check on that. And if it's strong enough, then I uh, ensure to the client that this structure is strong enough to take the load according to ISO. Unless sometimes the uh, operator can give me a specific value based on um, fishing company, which uh, is in the area. So then I will use it. Um, here, here, if we talk about uh, the structural uh, analysis or uh, the requirement I need to do, it's it's, it's kind of a big simulation here, what we're trying to do, because as I mentioned, um, it's a challenge in subsea that uh, it's you are placing a structure where no man will be able to go down there. So you need uh, as much as possible to place your structure without a problem. You are imagining the structure from being fabricated at site till it's uh, being lowered to the subsea and it reach its uh, final location in, in the seabed. So uh, here, if you miss anything, uh, it could stop the operation. So we try as much as possible to check the structure against all uh, possible scenarios. From uh, the right side, the one 
uh, I'll start with uh, the in place loadout and fabrication. Uh, what we do here, you design your structure, starting from the loads that will come through the flow lines or the co connection system. You will take uh, this load and you can use assumptions or um, take it from your connection system and apply it to your uh, structure. You uh, also uh, take from the piping department the, the, the values on the, all the supports coming uh, during the pressure test. Here we uh, normally, let's say most cases, we, we design the system with uh, by multiplying almost uh, 1.5 and sometimes 1.1. Uh, design pressure and then see the loads and apply it and also you uh, apply the loads coming from normal operation uh, you are placing bulbs and you have thermal expansion all this you apply uh, in the structure uh, if you have pigging uh, it's, it's minimal but we put it like if you have any loads uh, in the pipes uh, slugging uh, this normally we use in um, in, uh, in oil in oil fields uh, where uh, you imagine if you have slug hitting at one bend, so it's like something hits a bend hardly. So here you apply a point load, and uh, you of course uh, design it also as I mentioned. Uh, it's a must again. It's dropped object as you can see in that picture. You have uh, here GRP panels or steel panels. So you place it on top, and also you apply uh, the dropped object uh, loads. Uh, as, as dedicated from the ISO code. Uh, also, we check transportation, like uh, you imagine your structure being uh, on top of the uh, vessel, here, the installation vessel, and uh, it's traveling a long way and you have the pitch roll heave. It's like the ship is moving up, down, right, left. So it's creating more like a fatigue, uh, fatigue loads in, in your structure. So you need to make sure that uh, it's, it's strong enough. You are testing the pipe supports, uh, or even if you uh, we use temporary supports where you like lashing and so on, where you can later remove uh, just before installation. So here you, you don't need a surprise that something broke in the sea and uh, your big structure is loose. It's very dangerous. So that's one scenario we are checking. And uh, one important scenario also is uh, lifting. We, we check, uh, like we, we do even before the installation campaign, you lift the manifold at site and you uh, check if everything is going well. You are checking the, the lifting points, uh, everything. And, uh, and you make sure that it's, it's, uh, it's working. And in some cases, you place even um, like uh, big uh, uh, weights of steel uh, to simulate, let's say, trapped water weight. Because uh, when this structure goes underwater and uh, you also checking the scenario where you will need to uh, lift it again, uh, like a retrieval, then you actually are um, lifting more weight than its actual weight because you there are trapped water inside most of the steel structures. So here uh, you, you you check the lifting is uh, a very high uh, safety factor according what we use most now uh, speaking about the codes. <clears throat> we use uh, DMV uh, H series. It's a new one which replaces uh, a very old code also by DMV done many years ago in 1996. Uh, finally, we, are, uh, we, we spoke about occasional loads like earthquake, it's possible to happen. So in, in some places, if there is a requirement, so uh, we use uh, added uh, water mass met method to check that the structure will withstand uh, a possible earthquake and at the seabed without any problems. Uh, piping also is a, is a challenge, uh, speaking about the design codes, uh, because when we talk about the ASME code, there is nothing uh, till now is dedicated for subsea. Uh, so most cases we use ASME uh, 31.8, uh, section 8, 
which is actually for offshore offshore structures. Uh, this is in most cases, this is your main design code. In some uh, customers, uh, like in Australia, they prefer to use a DNVOSF101, which is for subsea uh, structures. And, uh, and of course, we follow as well the ISO 13628, any requirements needed there, we follow. And uh, we use uh, that one I mentioned, the API 111 for ones. Uh, we use for um, calculation, it's normally hand calculation, we check the pipe when it's under water and uh, it can uh, suffer from uh, external buckling because you have an external pressure acting on the pipes, right? This is not mentioned in the ASME code. So we have to do some checks, especially for uh, small lines to make sure that when you place the pipe, uh, the external pressure on uh, on that this pipe underwater will not uh, damage the pipe. On top of that, we we use norm the normal uh, ASME codes like for fittings uh, ASME sixteen point nine, and sometimes if you have a, a diver solution uh, with flanges, we still follow the ASME sixteen point five. Now, uh, this uh, interesting comparison I uh, I saw to show you uh, uh, because for, first I was I was always uh, I came from the top uh, top side industry so I was more used to the, um, the ASME code uh, I was not using a lot of API code in uh, in the subsea as I mentioned uh, what what happened many years ago starting from the Christmas trees you can see that the Christmas trees are designed as per API uh, code. So you can always refer to, you can see it, uh, Christmas tree saying uh, it's 5,000 PSI or 5,000 class uh, or, uh, or 10,000 class. And uh, here all the structure follow it. So you can see that whole system is designed for uh, uh, 5,000 PSI. 5,000 PSI is almost like 345 bar, right? Uh, so that's how it works. And even the valves where I will purchase, it will also be following that. Uh, in, uh, in top side, uh, offshore and onshore, normally uh, we follow, like starting from the flanges, the weakest point, uh, we follow the ASME 16.5. And as you all know, we follow... Uh, Spe specific uh, classes or rating like the class 150, 300, 40, up to 2,500 is the biggest. And you can see that uh, in subsea pressures, it's much, much higher. It's not something you most cases find in, in ASME 16.5. You can, uh, for example, uh, small bore lines are always, most of the cases, 10,000 PSI, which is 690 bars. So it's much a lot, and that's before hydro test. Hydro test, you multiply it by 1.5, so it goes even higher. So this is a different uh, uh, methods why we why we use the, the API. As I mentioned, it starts from the Christmas trees, and uh, due to the um, uh, so extreme uh, water depths, which is sometime like in Zohar, it was. Uh, the depth was 1,500, and you have ultra depths right now, which is more than 2,000 meters. So here, uh, the pressures are much higher. Now, uh, we, we talked about, uh, time is running up, uh, I'll try to speed up. Uh, we talked about the structure analysis, uh, talking about the piping analysis, uh, we also uh, need to check different scenarios, uh, starting from fabrication till installation for the whole uh, manifold. It starts from uh, the FAT, uh, the FAT, where or the hydro test, where we hydro test it, and it could be really, uh, uh, it must be a, a very controlled operation because some most cases you you are talking about the pressure which is like one thousand bar. 
So we use sometimes uh, a bulletproof bulletproof walls uh, around the structure. It's very important so that in case every, anything happens, you are protecting uh, everyone. It's a very high pressure. Um, we are also testing the behavior of pipe supports. Uh, here I'm giving most of the time input to the structure engineers about the loads on the pipe supports uh, during uh, uh, transportation. And in here, well, what we do, we, we, we um, like in the analysis, we place different acceleration, different uh, and a lots of combination in the, uh, to simulate the pitch roll and heave. And also we, uh, we apply the loads coming from the connection system. Uh, also, there is a commissioning or a, a load case where we apply, um, as I remember, 1.1 times uh, the design pressure, uh, which simulates uh, the installation where are, they are connecting the MEG lines and so on uh, before op uh, not, uh, full operation of the structure. Uh, marine growth, it's like added weight. Sometimes it's needed, sometimes it's not, according to the life of the structure. Uh, earthquake also, same way, we uh, add uh, acceleration in different uh, directions to simulate uh, the earthquake shake of the pipes. And uh, one of the important checks you don't find an onshore or offshore, it's uh, the BID, which is a vortex induced region. And uh, the idea that they found that uh, in the previous time, they were not concentrating on the small line or small bore lines. So what happens when the structure is uh, on the seabed and you have uh, the tide uh, of, uh, of the water, it starts to also create like a fatigue action on the pipes. So at the end, the pipe could be broken. So here you are trying to make like a model analysis to uh, make sure that these pipes won't break. It, it, it can uh, withstand this fatigue action underwater. Uh, here, finally, there's a mix of uh, different hand calculations done for pipes. The one I mentioned, uh, the API uh, four ones, uh, is uh, a buckling and external pressure and collapse, no bending. These are uh, checks that need to be done. Uh, and, and this, like to imagine if you have an empty uh, plastic bottle of water and then you like uh, squeeze it with your hand, you can see that it will, uh, you know, it will collapse. This what what you are trying to avoid of the pipe, that you want to make sure that uh, external uh, pressure is still weaker than the internal pressure uh, and the material of the pipe, then it will not collapse. Uh, slug loads we talked about, we uh, apply here point loads in case of oil, that in case you have uh, slugs hitting during uh, uh, the operation a bend in the manifold or, uh, or, or your uh, pipe in general, it, it will not also damage the pipe. And pigging loads, sometimes it's needed. Uh, if, you, if you are using an intelligent pig, which is kind of heavy, you apply some loads to make sure that also uh, it will not damage the pipe supports or the pipes. VIV we talked about. Uh, here we do uh, also a screening according to DNV code, which will give you uh, like some, some uh, uh, criteria if your system is okay or uh, it needs more supports. Uh, finally, we check the valves uh, if the, the support is strong enough to, to hold it. Uh, here quickly, I will, uh, I will show you uh, some of the items normally a, a manifold holds. As, as we talked, uh, the manifold would be designed for uh, a horizontal connection system or a vertical connection system or both. Sometimes you can see uh, a production manifold uh, where uh, the branches are getting connected to a vertical connector, like the one you can see on the, on the right side. And uh, like the, the, the headers or the, you know, the output of the manifold is coming through a horizontal connector, like the one you can see on the left side. And also you having uh, lots of uh, electrical connectors, like the one you can see in the middle. 
and all that uh, normally is governed through the ISO code as well, who tells the vendor uh, according to what they, they should design. Uh, we talked, uh, I talked uh, quickly about the SCM, the subsea control module. This is the brain of the manifold. It have all uh, the, uh, the electronics needed uh, to give signals to valves to open, close, and so on. Uh, also, we need to place lots of uh, pressure temperature sensors, uh, which will give, uh, give us signals about any temperature or pressure rise. So it's very important to monitor. And all that also is uh, connected to the SCM where we, we get uh, this information uh, from uh, the, the online, the, the um, onshore facility. Uh, also, uh, one of the challenges we have is uh, subsea valves. Normally the size of them are fairly big. They are designed to very high pressures, as I mentioned. So they uh, can uh, uh, drive the whole design to be big or small according to the design. Um, finally, um, uh, we uh, when we talk about subsea, one of the main players is uh, ROV, uh, remote operated vehicles. And there is a huge development right now, like the one in the middle, and now it's, it was a concept and now it's turning to be a reality and uh, operators are using it where the ROV actually uh, you place it permanently underwater, you just leave it. And at any time, if you want to inspect your manifold or subsea structure, you can control it uh, without, um, let, let's say, uh, an, an offshore vessel and it can go and monitor and inspect your structure and go back. And you have also a new uh, design coming uh, from, it was developed in Norwegian University where uh, they studied the motion of the eels, uh, like the uh, subsea snakes, and they make robots which move like snakes where they can move around the structures and also being uh, stationary permanently underwater. And now we're also seeing new generations of uh, the manifold where it uh, could be uh, configured according to the operator needs. It's getting much smaller and uh, it's getting uh, also tailored according to uh, the client requirements. Uh, finally, I'll just close by this uh, nice video, it's just a two minutes, and it will show most of what I've talked about. It's a 10 years old uh, uh, video, but uh, most of what uh, you can see imaginary, it's actually turning a reality. It was done by uh, a Norwegian subsea company. So you can see uh, that even after 10 years, most of the concept are turning, turning to be a reality underwater.
All right, so I'm done a little bit uh, above time. So if you have any questions, please uh, ask if we have time. Uh, thanks a lot, Engineer Ayman. Uh, yes, we have a couple of questions on the chat box, if you can open them. Okay. Um, can you see them? Okay. Uh, f first, uh, there is a, a question regarding uh, alignment. Okay. Uh, connection alignment issue related to the hard pipe ends. How to overcome such thing? Also, the connection between Christmas tree and manifold. Okay. Uh, he, he, here, uh, to try to answer that quickly, uh, normally in, um, in, in SOPSI, uh, architects are uh, two types to connect structures. You have, uh, as you know, the flexible jumpers and uh, the rigid jumpers. Uh, flexible jumpers uh, solve that problem you're trying to mention because uh, here uh, the pipe is flexible it's just like a hose uh, it's about it's very very uh, costly and more expensive so uh, and, and according to seabed um, also configuration maybe i'll not be able to place in yogurt sub so so when when i'm having a rigid pipe as as, as it's from its name is rigid so uh, if, if i'm connecting christmas tree towards a manifold um, here, uh, normally the connection system needs to, to have some sort of um, tolerances, same like what we mentioned, the fabrication tolerance, and uh, so that the hub or the, connect, the connection system can little rotate, uh, let's say up to five degrees, four degrees, and so on in different uh, different direction, up and down, and, and mainly it's, it comes based from experience uh, from the connection system team. Uh, from previous projects uh, and, and uh, the need to uh, study uh, correctly the, um, the, the seabed survey and make sure that you are within uh, tolerances. And uh, it becomes uh, a very challenge, uh, challenging uh, task for whoever designed the jumper because uh, the jumper, it, it's a rigid pipe, but same time you're trying to make it a little flexible to compensate for such tolerances. Uh, and, and if it happens that you are um, uh, pull the connect, con the jumper uh, connection port connected hardly to the manifold, uh, it, it, for you it looks successful connection, but actually there is um, uh, tension in the jumper. So it, it can create problems. It's not, a, it's not relaxed. It's not even yet operational. So it can create problem. So it's a challenging point. It's a need a coordination between piping team and connection team, and to make sure uh, that that really uh, the pipe or the rigid pipe can uh, meet uh, the maximum tolerances of the connection system. Um, Okay, uh, uh, Phil here, uh, I feel you're asking about the, the ASME code. Yes, uh, here, uh, in most cases, uh, I'm not the one, uh, like I, I'm SPS contractor. Uh, I, I cannot here decide which code I'm going to use. Here I follow the specifications coming from the client. And let's say he can clearly tell me, okay, I want, it happens sometimes that I want the manifold to be designed according to ASME 31.3, uh, which normally is used for uh, topside onshore plants. And sometimes, uh, most cases, the client will give me the option. You can use 31.8 offshore or section 8 or the DMVOS. Uh, what's the difference between the three? I, I can tell you um, that after working piping many years, um, what happens uh, when we talk about ASME 31.3, it was de designed for, let's say, if you are designing a plant where uh, within some kilometers, people uh, will be living around it, or there are accommodation for workers and so on. So the, the safety level of uh, this code is very high. 
accordingly, the, the wall thickness of the pipes is thicker, right? So uh, if I'm using the design as a formula and so on, it will give me at the end uh, a thicker uh, piping, which is more costly for subsea. And uh, when we talk about subsea, the structure is underwater, so no, no people are living there. So I, I don't need to uh, increase um, the safety and, uh, in the design. So I'm using here, uh, for example, the 31.8, which uh, when you compare, gives you a fairly uh, smaller uh, or thinner wall, or, uh, wall thickness. And when it comes to DMVOS F11, it even gives me a much thinner pipeline uh, thickness. That's why in majority of subsea pipeline, I'm not talking about the manifold, the pipeline itself, you will see that it's designed according to the Norwegian or the DMV, uh, DMV uh, FS11, uh, because it gives me a thinner wall thickness. So, uh, so here, uh, customer is, uh, of course, uh, taking care about the hazard and risk or safety of people or the environment. And same time, he is looking uh, cost-wise how he can uh, lower the capex or the cost of uh, uh, the, the subsea architect. And uh, at the end, we normally use a mix between both uh, the ASME 31.8 and uh, the MVOS, but uh, till now, uh, when we talk about the umbilical and uh, small bore pipeline, we actually use the 31.3, not uh, which is mainly most of the time is tubing, uh, but not uh, 31.8. Um, moving down. Uh, the MVOS H206 is included in manifold installation. Yes, it's used. Um, Uh, DND is used in uh, in uh, for for subsea in many uh, in many uh, cases in uh, for um, as I mentioned for VIV calculations uh, for induced vibration it's used in uh, in installation uh, in lifting uh, we use a lot of them we use for screening uh, as I mentioned for uh, flow assurance some time for an erosion check. Uh, so, so there are a lot of uh, DMV codes uh, that we follow within the design itself, not as a main code, but as a helping or supporting code. Okay. Um, yes, I think the, uh, that was most of the questions. I got one question, Ayman, if you don't mind. Uh, do you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, first of all, it's, it's a great presentation, Ayman. I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed and really thank you for the time and, and, and for sharing the information. Um, the second question really for me is, uh, other than the comment, it's the um, uh, the pressures, you know, from your experience, what was the highest pressure you've ever seen? Um, currently, uh, with my current profession, I, I work in the same field like yourself. Um, I'm getting a lot of requests for Subsea hardware, which is 15K, 17 and a half K. Um, some actually asking me for the 20K solution. Um, so what, what would be your thoughts about that kind of, of technology stretch? Yes, uh, the, big, the biggest one I've used, it was 20K. And uh, that was a big one. Uh, the, the idea, uh speaking about that point sometimes uh, as i mentioned uh, it, it it seemed like any field in uh, top side or offshore uh, what did it dedicate that pressure is uh, reservoir itself uh, it comes from process engineers or reservoir engineers who will tell tell you what design pressure i need so when it comes high then the, okay the christmas tree vendor will go for the for example the 20k or the 20000 psi uh, here, um, okay, if I am a piping engineer, a revolve engineer, and uh, uh, let's start from the piping, and I, I need to follow this, uh, I need uh, then to give options to uh, along to the team, along to the material engineer, because here I'm having uh, some options. 
uh, you have uh, the, the, the carbon steel pipe and you have uh, which used uh, largely in subsea the duplex and super duplex piping and the duplex and super duplex piping are uh, very strong material so they can take higher pressure and they are expensive as well much more expensive so there could be like uh, you are checking between two scenarios i can buy uh, cheap carbon steel pipes uh, but uh, according to the design uh, design pressure which is high the wall thickness will be uh, very thick so the welding will be expensive uh, uh, weight wise it will be heavier and so on and also um, most cases when i use uh, this solution like carbon steel i will uh, i'll go for what's called the cladding so I will need to place a thin layer of uh, more like a stainless steel inside the carbon steel pipe, like five millimeter or eight millimeter for corrosion, erosion, and these things. So also uh, cladding is, is not a very easy operation uh, because you will give the carbon steel to a vendor and he will try to place the cladding inside. And it can give you some challenges when you are doing if you have a pegging solution, it uh, also can give you some challenges. Now, the, the other solution, if you go to the super duplex or uh, the duplex family, as I mentioned, it's it's much more stronger uh, material. So then the wall thickness will be thinner. So then you avoid or you overcome the, the weight problem. You don't need cladding. Uh, you will just have a pipe thinner some, somehow. And uh, it, it's more, um, you're, you're, you saved some cost. But the pipe itself, it turns to be more like a long lead item because you will wait some time till the vendor will do it for you. And it's much more costly. And there's another final point I didn't have time to talk about, which they found later. It will, it's called the HISC, uh, hydrogen-induced uh, stress creating. So uh, even this pipe uh, or the duplex and super duplex is a, is a very uh, strong material. They found that uh, in, uh, within a short time, uh, it's like it started to dissolve. There are cracks happened in the pipes and totally collapsed. Uh, and that uh, due to the nature of the material and how it uh, reacts with the hydrogen, hydrogen molecule in the water. So then you need, extra precautions when you are designing the pipe roughly i would say that you try to have the stress in a limit which is less than 80 percent so it, it's a challenge uh, but there are solutions um, and and what can help you is uh, it comes in the material selection excellent thank you that's actually very good uh, Ivan, and also Ahmed, thanks for the question uh, I think this is the uh, the longest session we ever had. It's like one hour and 20 minutes. This uh, speaks a lot about the content. Thanks a lot, Engineer Ayman. And also, thank you very much for our uh, honorable uh, guests. We had a lot, like uh, 29 people uh, at some point of the webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, this session will be uh, record it's recorded already and will be uh, uh, on our YouTube channel and LinkedIn as well. Uh, and also, I would like to ask you to keep uh, following our page for uh, the coming sessions. And also, we thank you, Engineer Ayman, very much. And we would like to ask to join us uh, one more or two more this year for more information. Thank you very much. Sure, I'll be, be delighted. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, sorry for keeping you, but it was really interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, yeah.